pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just uh, want to lift your name up this morning. Father, you know all things, and you know what's supposed to come out of me today. And I hope you know it better than I do. So I just hope that you, Father, I ask you, Father, to just uh, move through me today and give me the words to say the way you want them said, Father. Let it come out the way you want them to come out, Father, and accomplish your purpose. Your word says that your word will not return void. It will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it for. Lord, I trust you to do that today in the name of Jesus. Open our hearts and our minds and uh, do what you will in our lives today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I had more trouble probably putting this sermon together than uh, maybe anyone I've ever had problems with. So uh, y'all just pray for me, okay? Uh, how many of y'all have, I hope we don't have too many religious spirits in here, okay? Uh, but uh, how many of y'all at some point in your life have had any dealings with uh, with gambling? With, uh, uh, you know, like, like poker and, and that kind of gambling? Games of chance? Well, good, good, I'm not the only one. Uh, how many of you know in that, in that atmosphere what it means to be all in? Y'all understand that? I didn't understand that for a long time. My boy was interested in poker a while back in this new video poker they play and stuff, and so I began to hear about the term. But uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, in the Old West days, uh, when you, you see them on TV, you know, they're playing these card games, and they play for table stakes. And, and uh, so if one guy's got a lot of money and the other guy's just got a little money, and one guy gets a pretty fair hand, or if, if he doesn't have a hand, sometimes he can bluff the other guy out just by betting a whole lot of money. And the other guy can't afford to get in, so he's, he's automatically out, because you have to put up your money right there. Well, all in means if you've got a whole lot of money and I've just got a little bit of money and I've got a really great hand and I just know will win, I can say, well, I'm all in. And at that point, it's me playing everybody else that was in at that point, okay? And so if I win, I get that part of the pot. But the game can go on after I'm all in. And, uh, and then y'all are all playing each other if you keep betting, keep raising. Uh, and if I lose, then... It's just like I would never end the game, the pot's the same. If I win, I get that part of the pot that was there when I went all in. Y'all kind of understand that? It's yeah. kind of hard to understand. But how many of you think that, uh, that at the Last Supper and, and the events that followed that and, and on the cross, how many of you think that Jesus was all in? You know, I'd be in a poker game and I can, I can have you know, $500 in my pocket, I can bet that and be all in. But that's not the way Jesus was all in because I could have some more money in the bank. I could have some more of this, some more of that. You know, I'd only be all in for what I had on my person that day, right? But Jesus was all in, period. And, uh, you know, this is Palm Sunday. And... Uh, I just, I want to talk today, I, I'm, I had some revelations this week as I studied, and I spent eons of time laboring over how to, to, to what God wanted me to present and how He wanted me to present it. And uh, I've got tons of scriptures, and I looked at it this morning as they were putting it up there, and I thought, I will never get through that. And, uh, and nobody will stay for all of that either. But, uh, but as I studied this week, and I, I, I hate to do this because it kind of tells y'all how, how illiterate I am in the Bible in some areas, in some ways, you know. I mean, I guess you like to think your preacher's got a little bit of Bible knowledge, and, and I thought I did too. But, uh, but how many of you know that sometimes you just run across something that, that you think you should have known, and you wonder if everybody else really knows it? And, and if you all do, then I'm going to feel pretty silly, but, and you may all, but, you know, in John, John gives the most uh, thorough uh, description 
of, uh, of, of in, in a mostly chronological order of the events between uh, the Palm Sunday, the, the Jesus' entrance on the, on the donkey, uh, with everybody singing Hosanna to the highest and praising Him and, and, and like they were inaugurating a ruler that was coming in. And uh, John gives a, a greater detail of that through the Lord's Supper, through the, the garden, and through the whole thing of, of uh, any of the other Gospels. And as I studied this week, and we're also studying the miracles in John in our 9 to 10 Bible study on Sunday morning, and so those two kind of folded together for me. We studied, uh, uh, this week our study was on uh, the resurrection of Lazarus, and that's the event that takes place shortly before the, the other events that follow. Uh, so as I studied, uh, the... Uh, the Last Supper is is kind of early in John. I think it, it starts in uh, chapter 12. And then it goes on, and there's a whole lot of stuff after that. And then it goes to the to the Garden of Gethsemane. And all of those things that Jesus said in between there, I've studied all of those stories and all of those lessons and all of those things over and over and over. Some of them are my most favorite scriptures. For instance, uh, John 15, where Jesus said, uh, uh, I am the true, I am the vine, and you are the branches. You can't do anything unless you abide in me. If, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it shall be done. And that's that's one of, one of my many all-time favorite scriptures. But you see, I, I studied that and I studied the all the other things that Jesus did in that in that time sequence, but I don't think I ever fully realized that that was among the last things that Jesus said and did. I don't think I fully got that that was after the the, the Lord's Supper, which incidentally most scholars seem to believe that that was not on the Passover. That was a meal they were celebrating as the Passover before the Passover, because He was the Passover Lamb that was going to be sacrificed. And, uh, but anyway, uh, I just want to kind of carry you through, and I encourage you, uh, if you haven't done it, and if you're anywhere close to where I am in your understanding, or where I was, and, and, and I encourage you to go to, uh, to John, uh, start about chapter 11 or 12, and, and study that all the way through in the context of the Last Supper, and then all of these teachings that he does and all of these things that he does with his disciples and then into the garden and into the cross. I encourage you to, maybe I'll stir you up. Uh, and I'm not even going to ask if all y'all were already aware of all of that because I don't think I want to know. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to start off in, in Romans 12, 1. Uh, that song that, that we sang, He is my all in all kind of was, was a result of what I got out of some of this study because I don't believe that most of us are all in in the sense that he wants us to be all in. Uh, so Romans 12, 1 uh, is another old familiar scripture to me uh, and it's one that's, that's precious to me. Uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, you know, how many of y'all really try to present your bodies a living sacrifice and really try to live for Him? Uh, I know I try. I'm not saying that you do it perfectly. I'm just saying how many of you have a heart that you want to be a servant of His and you want to present your body as a living sacrifice. I, I thought that would be the case. Most of us want to do that. And probably most of us feel like at different times that we fall short of it and we don't do a good enough job of it. Uh, but I want you to know that Jesus loves you just for wanting to, okay? He loves you, period. He loves you if you don't want to, but He loves you if you try, even if you don't go as far as you want to go. 
But, but the fact is, is, you know, that verse would have to read a little bit different for Jesus. Because he was presenting himself as a sacrifice. Not a living sacrifice, but as a sacrifice. So he was all in. And I think the desire of my heart is to be as all in as it's humanly possible to do. And uh, even coming up here this morning, uh, I, I want to be all in enough to relax and just tell you the story. And uh, I sometimes follow my notes too much, and you know, I think that comes from a, a, an insecurity or maybe a lack of faith in Him coming through. But, uh, but anyway, look at Matthew 21, verses 6 to 11. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And said, uh, let's see, they, bought, they brought the donkey, the coat, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a, and a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from trees, spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And uh, that was a custom. Anytime a new king or somebody was inaugurated, they'd have a grand entry like that. And, and this was God's way of presenting Jesus. And, and, but they all thought that he was coming to take over the government, to rescue them from the, the rule that they were under. They all thought he was coming for an earthly kingdom. And, and they were all excited about it. And then a couple of days later, they're, they're putting him on a cross. But, uh, but that was his grand entrance. And then if you look at Luke 22, verse 7, uh, and, and that day after that, he made that was his, his last public appearance after that. He went to the, to the synagogue and he taught, and he, he taught a lot of things in between there. But, uh, and then after that, uh, he comes to Luke 22, 7, and he says, Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. So they said to him, uh, Where do you want to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So, we, so they went and found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. Uh, this is setting it up for, for him. He knows where he is. He knows what time it is. He knows uh, what's coming ahead of him. Then if you go on to verse 14, it says, When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Now, you know, if I were him, I don't know if I would have been desiring fervently to get to that last supper with them, uh, knowing what comes after that. Uh, how many of you would have been running to that last supper knowing that within just a day or two that you were going to be hanging on the cross? Uh, when I think about what Jesus knew and, and what he was willing to do, it just, it just blows my mind, really, how, how that can happen. I know he was God, but he was in a human body, and, and he was totally, fully, 100% human. And he had the same emotions and things that we do. Uh, but uh, and if you look up in the commentary for Luke 22, 15, it says he knew it was to be the prologue to his suffering. And therefore the desi he desired it because it was the order to his Father's glory. 
and man's redemption. He knew the importance of it. He knew the impact of it. He knew the end of the story. But yet he still knew that he had to go through all of that suffering. And if you don't have a good picture of his suffering, come, uh, when is it, Randy, Friday night? Come Friday night and see the Passion of the Christ. It gives a very vivid description uh, of his suffering. And he suffered more than most of us understand if we haven't seen something that graphic. Uh, but I believe it was very realistic. But he knew all of that. He understood all of that. Uh, anyway, verse 17 says, He took the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, Take and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant. How many of you are glad for a new covenant? Amen. In my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Uh, and then they begin to question among themselves which one it was and who would do such a thing. Uh, So that's, that's pretty much the front end. And, and I want to skip ahead now to the garden. Okay, let's just, let's just play like we, we have a time lapse. And we're going to come back and we're going to pick up here in a minute. But, uh, but we're going to just skip ahead to the garden, which is in Luke 22, 39. Uh, coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed. And his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and, bring, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Can you imagine, can you put yourself in, in that place that you know you're going to an execution, and not just an execution, but a horribly painful uh, execution where you're going to be naked before the world and all your pain and all your suffering and, and you're going to have nails through your hands and your feet and you're going to be suspended in air with all your weight on those nails and hanging. Can you imagine the, the suffering that he went through? Can you imagine going there and knowing it and understanding what, what he had to overcome to get on that cross? Uh, I think most of us would, would not make it. Probably, probably none of us would make it. Um, but, but he did. He prayed more earnestly and sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer uh, and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. And then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, at least you enter into temptation. And if you read the other accounts in, in different places, uh, he evidently came back to them several times and found them sleeping. And then finally he said, okay, go ahead and, and get your rest. But, um, but now I want to go back. I want to look at the things that happened between the supper and the drops of blood. Uh, and knowing that he was going to depart soon, he, I think he, he stepped away from, from everything for just a minute in his mind. And as he was finishing up supper, you know, he must have looked around and, and Judas left. And I think maybe he looked around the room at them, around the table, and he said, Oh my God, I'm going away. These guys are taking over. Uh, oh my goodness. I, I, he may not have thought those exact words, but, but he must have. How many times did they, did they mess up? How many times did he say, Oh, you have little faith? And how many times do, do we think they got it, even as we studied Lazarus this morning? You know, those guys, 
They didn't understand everything that was going on. Most of the time, they understood very little of what was going on. They, they fed the 5,000, and then the next day, they're, they're worried about the boat sinking, you know? Uh, and, and I think he looked at it, and, and he thought, you know, I better do some review. You know, they're going to have a test in a few days, and it's going to be a long test, and, and they, they got to know the material. Maybe I better just go through this stuff with them one more time. That's what I think happened. And, and that's what I never realized, that we went from there to all those teachings. I've studied those teachings over and over. I've heard sermons on those teachings. But I think without realizing the fact that, that it was their last opportunity to hear those things, and he all of a sudden, I mean, it wasn't all of a sudden to him, it seems all of a sudden, but, but he, he, he knew that they weren't quite ready. They needed another little dose. So I want you to, to pay attention as I try to, uh, to quickly move through uh, the, uh, the rest of it. Uh, are, the, are the monitors off behind me? I hear a guest coming over my shoulder. Uh, so the first thing they did, Luke 22, verse 24, it says, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Can you imagine they're at the Last Supper, they're with the Lord, He just told somebody they're going to they're gonna go and, and, uh, and let him out, and, and, and he's told them over and over, he's coming to the end, and, and, and here they're saying, which one of us is going to be the greatest? Should I get top gun or should you? Or should, you know, should it be you or you know, Ben or somebody else? You know, who, who's going to be the, the head guy when we get to this, to this place you know, where, you, where we're going to, going to get all these promises taken care of? And of course, he knows what they're doing. And uh, he gives them another, another lesson. He said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise leadership over, over those uh, who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But it's not so among you. On the contrary, he who is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. So what he's saying is the head guy needs to be the biggest servant around here. And you guys, you're, you're sitting there talking about who's the greatest? He could have said, I can tell you who's the greatest. I'm the greatest. Because he is, he was, and he always will be. But he didn't do that. He said, he said, just, just look. He said, uh, he said, uh, who is the greater? He who sits at the table or he who serves? Uh, is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. And here's where I think he's. He's thinking, you know, these guys, if they're going to do all the stuff they need to do, they need to know that there's a reward. Okay? Do we sometimes lose sight of the fact that, that he, he rewards those that serve him? He rewards those that, that obey the word? Or, or do we sometimes lose sight of the fact that it's the goodness of God that draws us to repentance? And that God loves us and has promises to us? He said, you stuck with me through all my trials. And I bestow on you a kingdom just as my Father bestowed one on me that you may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes. I don't know when they thought that would be, but he was telling them, you got a place. you got a place. You've been faithful. You've served. Even though you were dummies and even though you didn't understand, I know you're going to do good and you've got a place, okay? And, and I don't know if y'all know it or not, but we've all got a place too. And, and to me, he's speaking this to us as much as he spoke it to them. Uh, and then in John 13, uh, uh, comes, he, he's going to wash their feet. He says, you know, before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew his hour had come and that he should depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I mean, he's teaching these guys and loving and caring for them and reassuring them and, and Continuing to bolster them up and get them ready right to the end, okay? Without any thought about himself. How many of us would have been curled up in the fetal position somewhere thinking about how can I get out of going to that cross? How can I get out of the suffering of my own self? He never, it was there. He sweat the drops of blood in the garden. I mean, that tells you how, 
how hard it was for him to overcome the flesh to say, yes, God, I'm going to go do it. And he never intended not to do it. It evidently crossed his mind because he said, let it pass from me if possible. But if not, your will be done, not mine. Can we come to the place where we'd rather have His will than ours? Be careful how you shake your head. Amen. We, we, we need to get there. Anyway, uh, so after suffering, the devil had already done his thing with Judas, and, and uh, Jesus, knowing that God had given all things to His hands, and He'd come from God and flowing back to God, He rose from supper, laid aside His garments, took towels, girded Himself. And after that point, he poured water in a basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel. Now, can you imagine the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords getting up from the table, taking off his garments, wrapping a towel around his waist, and getting down before each one of those men one at a time and washing his dirty feet? Can you picture that? You know, they've been walking for a while. And I can't imagine what those dirty feet look like. And I guess they, they smell like some of ours. You know, they wore that over the road and over the area, you know, so they didn't stink from that. But they were dirty. Amen? And the king of kings cut on his knees and washed and dried their feet. And, and you know the story about how he came to Peter and he says, are, are you going to wash my feet? No, I will never, never, never. You can't wash my feet. He says, well, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. And he says, you're not going to understand what I'm doing, but you will understand. And, uh, and, and uh, he says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. In verse 9, Simon Peter said to him, he said, Lord, not my feet only then, but also my hands, my head, wash my whole body. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet. But is completely clean. You are clean. He said, but not all of you. And he didn't mean but not all of Peter. He meant but not all of you twelve because one, he knew was going to betray him. And by the way, speaking of that, you know, there's never any record that I've ever seen of him uh, treating Judas any different from what he treated all the rest of us. And all the time, he knew from the beginning what was going to happen and he was going to betray. What does that tell us how we ought to act to each other? Hello? Anyway, uh, he says, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you're not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down with them, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you say, well, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, King of kings and Lord of lords, creator of the universe, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. You ought also, you think he, you think he meant that for us as well as the disciples? You think we ought to wash each other's feet? You know what he meant when he said you ought to wash each other's feet? Uh, even the commentaries talk to that to that scripture. I looked up a couple of them, and and they said well he was talking about uh, forgiveness. So washing the feet means that you know you're going to sin and you have to come back. And washing the feet is symbolic of asking God to forgive you for your sins again, so you can be in fellowship with Him. I found that in two different commentaries, but that is not what he was talking about. He told them you're already clean. So what did he mean when he said, you need to wash one another's feet? How do, how do we wash each other's feet? Well, we serve one another, but how do we serve one another? If, if, if I see you doing something that I think is wrong, that, that, or if I think you're messing up somewhere, how do I wash your feet? You, you think those, I mean, those guys were arguing about who was going to be the greatest. 15 minutes earlier, or maybe an hour earlier, they were arguing about who's going to be the greatest. So if I see somebody walking around here doing something that that 
I got I shouldn't I shouldn't be doing. It's not a good witness. It's not a good testimony. Maybe it's not flavor of sin, but but uh, but they're just they're doing something wrong. How how do I treat that? How do I accept that? How do we work together in the kingdom of God? If I'm washing your feet, I'm accepting you as the way you are. If I'm washing your feet, I'm ignoring the fact that I know you're going to betray me down the road and sell me out for 30 pieces of silver. And if I know that that's going to happen, I ignore it. I treat you as if you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I treat you as if the Savior Himself has forgiven all of your sins. Who am I to hold something against you, whether it's a sin or just something that I think is going to hurt somebody else or hurt you or whatever. The whole point is that we have to accept each other the way Jesus accepts us. How many of you did Jesus wait for you to get perfect before he accepted you and made you a new creature? Hello? How many of us would be there if we had to wait that long, okay? He didn't say go clean yourself up and then come to me. He didn't say you know, pick out the worst one among you and, and go clean him up so that I can accept him. He said, you come to me as you are and I'll receive you and I'll clean you up in my time and the rest of you accept him until I get him cleaned up. Amen? I think that's what washing your feet is all about. Washing your feet is about trusting each other whether we, whether we feel like they're trustworthy or not. It's about giving opportunities to fail. It's about letting people serve no matter where they came from or what they're doing. Now there's some exceptions to that. If you're in a, you know, in blatant sin or you're in open, openly disgracing and not living according to God's, God's ways and terms, there's, there's times when we have to, especially as far as public ministry is concerned, I mean, if you knew that I have six girlfriends out there somewhere and visiting a neighbor, you wouldn't think I should be up here preaching, would you? And there are letters, but, but for, for nearly everything, we need to accept each other and overlook the flaws, overlook the... I mean, how many of you haven't got some kind of a little bitty sticker in your own eye? Huh? You know, we're supposed to get the things out of our eyes. I'm the one that I'm supposed to be worried about, not you. I can't get the, the log out of... I just stick her out of your eyes and I get the log out of my own eyes. Do we, do we get that? Uh, he says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you think about them. Hello? Blessed are you if you do them. You know, you can sit here and hear them all day. If you don't do them, you're not blessed. If you do them, you're blessed. So look at, uh, again, we're going to John 13, verse 38. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in, glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little longer. He's talking to 12 disciples. He says, little children, I will be with you just a little while longer. Listen to me. I think that's what he's saying to them. You will see me. And as I said to, to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Now, is that a new commandment to love one another? Huh? That's not new. That, that, you know, they asked him a long time ago. They said, what's the greatest commandment? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So what's the new command? He finishes it. He said, the new commandment I give you that you love one another, semicolon, as I have loved you. You've got to wash each other's feet. You've got to accept each other. You've got to tolerate each other. You've got to play like you like somebody, even if you don't, really. Well, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to play out. Well, Jesus said to love one another. He loves how you act. So you act like you love them. You act right to them, no matter how you feel. How I many of you know that the people have different personalities? And I can, I can feel very, very loving and sweet towards one person 
and another person I can I can act really really like to them, but I don't have the same feeling for everybody. I mean, you don't either, do you? It's not just me, is it? Am I weird? <laughs> don't answer that. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to ask that. I didn't mean to ask that. Uh, I want no answer to that. Uh, but he gave them a new commandment. Uh, and then he predicts Jesus, uh, Peter's denial, verse 36. Uh, Simon Peter asked him, he said, Lord, where are you going? See how much they knew and understood? He said, where are you going? And Jesus answered, he said, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay my life down for your sake. And then he kind of said, no. And Jesus answered, he said, you will lay down your life for my sake. Most assuredly, I say to you, before the rooster crows three times, you'll deny me three times. Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And, and then skip over to John 14, going right on down. Uh, you know, he's talked about where he's going. And, and uh, now he feels like, hey, you know, I, I've, got to, I've got to bolster him up a little bit. I've got to, I've got to encourage him some. You know, I'm telling him some hard things, and, and I think they need some encouragement. And they need to understand more about this thing and where I'm going. So he says, let not your hearts be troubled. He could see him get in trouble, you know. And he says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he, he tells him a little bit about, about heaven. He says, you know, in my father's house there's many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. And I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And if I do that, I'm going to come back and receive you to myself again. And then in verse 6, he says, he said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. How much plainer can he say it? There's one way, only one way, no other way. I don't care what anybody says, there's only one way, and Jesus is the way. He was the sacrifice for our sin. He shed his blood uh, on that cross for us. He was the, the sacrificial lamb that took away the sin of the world for those who received it. Amen? Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and then he, I think he says, well, you know, but they got to understand this relationship better. I still don't know if they get it. He says, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And then Philip pipes up, well, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be sufficient for me. Hello? Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long, and yet you have, you have not known me? Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you understand what he's saying? Jesus came for us to know the Father. And he and the Father are one. So if we know Jesus, and, and, and we're beginning to know him the more we study, he said that he was the Word and he became flesh and he dwelt among us so that we could know the Father. He was showing us the Father. And the more you study, the more you grow, the more you reach out to Him, the more you surrender to Him, the more you, you obey what He says because you want to, because you know how much He loves you, the more you understand the Father. Uh, he says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He said, look at all these things I did. If you can't believe anything, believe that I couldn't do that without God. So you can believe because of the works. Do you see the reinforcement that he's given these guys to get them for the final preparation for what they had to do? And some of them were going to die horrible deaths and they were going to be through all kinds of problems and ridiculed and tormented. They were, they were going to have a rough time. And he's, this is the final, this is the, the graduation, what do they call it? The, the gradual, huh? The what? Graduate, well, it's more than the graduation ceremony. It's what do they call a higher education when you go after your master's degree. This is, uh, huh? No, they got, a, they got another name for it. Uh, graduate work. Yeah, this is graduate work. You know, you've been to high school, you've been to college, now you're going on to the seminary. Uh, that, that's, that's what he's doing with them, I think. 
uh, yeah, for the works themselves. And, uh, and then he prayed. Uh, he, told, he told them that I'll answer your prayers. He said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me and the works that I do, uh, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And, and whatever you ask in my name that I may do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I will do it. Do you think that applies to us as well as to the disciples? Yes. This is to grant you, of course, you say, hey, trust me. Let me live in you the way I live in the Father and the Father lives in me and we both want to live in you. And, and when you get to that place, you're going to be there. Verse 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father, he will give you another helper. You know, he's thinking, he's thinking, now, I'm going to go away. I've told him I'm going to go away and, and it looks to me like they're getting nervous, you know. All of a sudden, after three years, they're going to be on their own. He says, he says, I've told them that something's coming, but I better reinforce it for them. I better, I better give them a little bit better view of it. Uh, he says, uh, I'll send you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will come to you. A little longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Yes. I will manifest myself to him. The Word says that you can know that you have eternal life. Do you know how you can know? Because God will manifest himself to you in your knower, in your spirit, because He lives in you. And He will make you aware of it and He will bring it to, to full acceptance in you. <coughs> he's in me. I know He's in me. And you can believe and you can have confidence. Uh, and Judas, not as scary, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered, He said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our home with him. Hallelujah. Yeah. See, that's why the people in the world don't know and don't believe, because they haven't, they haven't accepted him. And he has to come and live in them. He, he may be talking to them. He may be calling on them, knocking on the door of their heart, but they're not opening the door so they can't hear him because he doesn't live in them. He hasn't manifested himself. Because they haven't invited him to. Uh, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him. We will come to him. We will make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my word. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. He said, this is all God, guys. you got you got to wake up. you got to get it. Uh, verse 29, he says, I've told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk with you, uh, much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. And he has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave commandment, so I do. Arise, let's go from here. And, and then John 15 has always been I studied that and studied that and studied that back when I was in the other denominational church that I came from. And, and I spent a lot of years, you know, it says, I am the true vine, 15 I am the true vine, my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the words which I have spoken. And it goes on, it says, uh, it says, uh, uh, 
It says, yeah, abide in me and I in you as the branch bears, uh, cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. And I, I spent years trying to figure out what that meant to abide in him. Because it says, if you abide in me and my word abide in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done. And I always believed that, but I, I, didn't, I didn't get the abiding part. And, and the abiding part comes by faith. It comes by knowing that you live, He lives in you. And you have to, by an act of your will, live, choose to live in Him. You have to choose to, to believe the things that He says and do. And you have to submit yourself to Him. That's how you abide in Him. I abide in my house. I down the road here. I live there. And we have to live in Him. In Him we live and breathe and move and have our being. That's abiding. When you get to that place where you live and breathe in Him, and in Him you have your being. That's, that's abiding when you get to that place. When you get to that place, you can ask whatever you wish, because you're going to be wishing the things that He wishes. You're going to be just like He's hearing the Father's voice and doing what the Father says. You can hear His voice and do what He says. And that's abiding. And that's where we... We need to be. And he's trying to get these disciples to understand this so that they can go through and endure the things that they're going to have to endure. Uh, how's my time going? We still got to help you. Uh, but when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. These things have I spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Uh, they, they will put you out of the synagogue. Yes, the time is coming. Whatever kills you, will kill you and think you're offering service to God. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Amen. <coughs> Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, <coughs> that you become a living sacrifice, only acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I don't know where you guys are, but uh, but this Easter's meaning a lot more to me. The more I study the Word, the more I understand more things. The more I get to know Jesus, the more I love the Father. And I've known for a long time that the Father loves me uh, without any conditions, unconditionally. But the closer I get, the more I understand the totality of His love. And we have to get there. It's the goodness of God that draws man to repentance. When we understand His goodness and His love, we get it. And we can relax. And just like He said to Lazarus, He says, He says, Lucy, He called me back to the dead. And Lazarus is standing there all bound up with a great clothes. And He says, Lucy, and lay him up. Amen. And you know, I got a feeling Lazarus didn't have to go to CR afterwards. Some of us, when we get saved and we get loosed, you know, we're loosed to go get go get help and we can go to CR and get rid of all of our hurts, habits, and hangouts. But Jesus wants to set you free. And he wants you to be free. Amen. CR is just a vehicle to do that. And then y'all still glad you came to church today. Amen. That must have been God. I really didn't think I could get through all this. We're going to have communion this morning. And uh, so if you guys will come and bring the table over. Before we do that, though, I just, I just want to ask, is there anybody in here who maybe hasn't, hasn't ever discovered the truth of the relationship with Jesus, maybe never has accepted Him, uh, as your Lord and Savior and surrendered your life to Him? Is there anybody here that doesn't know for sure that if you died today on the way home, that you'd go and 
I know the name of Jesus. So anybody here that's not certain, I'll share many times about my uncertainty and my if never before prayer. If you have any doubt in your mind, you should pray this prayer with me. And you should say, if never before. So if you have a doubt, I'm going to lead you in a, in a simple little prayer and listen to you to Jesus. So just pray this with me if you're not certain of your salvation. Just say, Father, if never before, right this minute, I want to come to you. I confess that I'm a sinner, that I need you. And right now, I want to surrender my life to you. I want to invite you to be my personal Lord and Savior. I know you, that Jesus is the Son of God. I know that you died for my sins. I know that God raised you from the dead. And I want you to be my Savior. I want you to come into my life and, and manifest yourself in me and to me. And let me know that I have eternal life. Let me be certain. And I want to serve you the rest of my life. Thank you that you forgave my sins and you made me the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now show me how to live it and walk it out. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer, you just became a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. And you ought to be jumping up and down and getting excited and saying, how a living place of Lord. But I won't ask you to do that in public place. But it is good for you if you raise your hand and say, I prayed that prayer. I made it with all my heart. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve you the rest of my life. Anybody, there's one back there. Anybody else? For just one, the angels in heaven dance saying, Hallelujah! Praise that prayer. You became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away, and all things became new. And you're a new creature, right? This minute. God's not looking at your past. He's seeing your future. And there's nothing you can do to mess it up with Him. Amen? Hallelujah.